foosh, foosh, foosh. Let's talk about the most common orthopedic fracture. This accounts for almost 20% or one in five of all orthopedic fractures. It's so common that it happens in young people, it happens in old people, and especially if you're a woman, you have a 15% lifetime chance of getting this fracture. We're talking about distal radius fractures. A distal radius fracture is a fracture of the radius, which is one of two bones in the forearm. This is the larger bone on the thumb side or outside of your wrist. It happens in the distal part, which means the part closest to the wrist. Like we talked about before, there's something called a bimodal distribution. So there's two times in your life when you're gonna get this fracture. The first is when you're young, and the second is when you're older, and they both have different mechanisms of action. When you're young, this happens when you have a high energy impact. It's me. So common things for us would be somebody falling off an electric scooter. being in a motor vehicle accident or any other kind of high energy fall, especially when you're trying to brace yourself or what we call a fall on outstretched hand or a foosh. And how can I forget falling on ice? The most common thing in Canada. The second time people are prone to this is when people are in the geriatric age or anyone over 65. And this happens from a low energy ground level fall. Distal radius fractures are a sign of osteoporosis and are an osteoporotic fracture. So you can imagine that when somebody who has poor bone falls from their ground level height, they try to foosh themselves or protect themselves and they end up breaking their wrists. When this happens, general people have a very sore, swollen wrist. And if it's severe and what we call displaced, so the bones have moved out of position, you can have what's called that classic dinner fork deformity. The first way that we would look at these is would be through an x-ray and we take a couple of shots uh, of your wrist. So when we take x-rays of your wrist, we look at certain criteria uh, for alignment to, to help us determine what the next reasonable step would be. And an easy way to remember these numbers would be what's called the 11-22-11 rule. What this means is that on the PA or posterior to anterior x-ray of the wrist, you shall have 11 millimeters of radial height, 22 degrees of radial inclination, and on the lateral, you should have about 11 degrees of what we call volar tilt. If any of these are significantly off or altered, this may require interventions. There are many subtypes of distal radius fractures and they all have an eponym or a specific name for them. So the most common type is a Collie's fracture and that's the classic foosh and fall and outstretched hand. And that results in that classic dinner fork deformity that we talked about already. When this happens, the distal part or the further down part of the bone is actually pointed upwards and shortened. And in this case, if it's significant, we have to put that back into the correct place or in other words, reduce it. If you've ever had a reduction or had a friend have a reduction or been part of the process, it can be pretty dramatic. It can be done either under local anesthetic block with what's called a hematoma block. And this is cool because we actually inject the local anesthetic into the hematoma or the big bruise that forms uh, in the joint and this actually provides really good pain relief. If that doesn't work, we can also sedate you uh, with some anesthetic uh, to make you woozy like you're going to the dentist and you won't remember anything. Once the pain is gone, however we do it, we generally have to pull or reduce the wrist and there's a very specific way we do that. Once we get the wrist back in the position, we'll put you into either a cast or a splint, which is a partial cast, and to hold it there and hopefully allow the bones to heal in the right position. The same things happen if you have any of the other types of distal radius fractures. So for example, a Smith fracture would be the opposite, where the distal part of the wrist actually goes downwards or volarly. Other types of distal radius fractures would be a, what's called a radial styloid fracture. So a fracture of the styloid process, also known as a chauffeur's fracture because they happen a lot when an airbag deploys when you're holding onto a steering wheel. And finally, there can be Barton types fracture, which are shear fractures. And they can either be a uh, volar on the bottom or dorsal on the top of the wrist. And these are quite unstable. These are a couple of examples of, of the more common things uh, that would be there. Some things that we would take into consideration are whether the fracture is in the joint or intraarticular, or whether there's a lot of soft tissue involved, or whether there's fractures of other bones like the ulna. If you've ever noticed, there's also not a lot of meat surrounding these bones, and it's kind of right under the skin. So there's also a chance that when you break it, the bone can actually pop out through the skin, which would be called an open fracture. And those are a bit of a surgical emergency. Once you've had this initial treatment, your doctor may decide that you need a CT scan and that will be another modality to have a better look at the alignment and the fracture uh, fragments. 
If you're lucky, many of these can actually be treated without an operation or non-operatively. And if this is the case, you'll get changed to a full cast at some point, and generally speaking, you have to wear that for about six weeks or so. You may have to have close follow-up in the first few weeks to make sure that the fracture doesn't move or displace further. Believe it or not, even in a cast, the fracture can still move, and that's why we ask you, generally speaking, to be non-weight bearing and minimally use that arm. If the fracture is in a poor position or there's some other reason that you need an operation, in those cases, we would book you for what's called an open reduction internal fixation or ORIF of the distal radius. This is one of the most common surgeries that we do. In the surgery itself, you may get a nerve block or a general anesthetic or a combination of the two. Uh, and depending again on what type of fracture you may have, you may either have an incision on the bottom of the wrist called the volar side or an incision on the top of the wrist called the dorsal side or sometimes maybe even both. Most commonly, people would generally have a single incision on the volar side of the wrist, but again, that's not in all cases. The most common way that we get down there is actually through what's called a flexor carpi radialis or FCR approach, or otherwise known as a modified Henry's approach, in which we actually uh, very gently retract some of the muscles out of the way and get down to the fracture. Once we're able to do that, we again reduce or put the fractures back into the right place and then afterwards put a plate on the bottom with some screws to hold it in place. Now keep in mind, these plates and screws are really small and these screws have a diameter of anywhere from two to three and a half millimeters. So they're not meant to take the full weight of your arm and body right away. The purpose of the plates are to hold the bone in the right position so that your body can heal it naturally. But that being said, the plate does give some stability so that you can do some earlier range of motion uh, as well, again, depending on your fracture type. Even if you have a surgery, you're probably going to go into a splint of some form uh, for about four to six weeks or so. In this time, you may be able to start some early range of motion as dictated by your uh, provider. Whichever way you have your fracture treated after about six weeks or so, that's when you're definitely out of your splint and can start some range of motion. And again, depending on your provider, they may or may not send you for some hand therapy. Even then, it takes some time before you can work your way up to full strength and full activities. And depending on your work, you may need to take some time off that as well. So while these fractures can be super impressive and sometimes super shocking to look at, fortunately, it's something that we deal with all the time. It's the most common orthopedic fracture. It happens in young people, it happens in old people. Rest assured that they're very well trained to take care of these for you. So if it happens in you, now you know a little bit more. My name is Dr. Adrian Huang and I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I explain complex ideas so that even an orthopedic surgeon can understand them. If you like this kind of information, you wanna learn more, like, comment, and subscribe. See you next time.